I believe about anybody could preach behind that. Praise God. Without the cross. That's not necessarily the message this morning, but I did ask the ladies to sing that. They could do that every week. It wouldn't offend me at all because there's a message in that. Without the cross, where would we be? I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. I'm going to read to you there a passage that you are very familiar with. But that's going to take us to a passage in the Old Testament uh, from really where the message is going to be this morning. So if you will, stand with me and open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And then in a few moments, we will be going over to 2 Samuel. But this morning, we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4. 
to that very familiar passage, at least I know it will be to many of you. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Brother Justin asked me this morning if I had a title to the message. I've always got a title to the message. Sometimes it's relevant and sometimes it's not. But I remembered something that I have read numerous times, written maybe in a little bit different form. But years ago I read something. It said something like this. Everything I needed to know in life I learned in kindergarten. Be kind and stick together. Now I want you to think about that. Be kind and stick together. There's a lot of truth in that. So I want to just entitle the message this morning, Be Kind. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you. Lord, we love you. And God, just want to give you praise this morning. And God, I thank you for every person in this building. God, you've open your heart to us. You've opened these doors to us. And God, I just pray that in response that we would open our hearts and our minds to you. And we would yield to you this morning, lay aside any distraction, Lord, that may keep us from being sensitive to your word. And I pray, God, that you would hide me behind the cross, give me the voice to preach this morning. And Father, I pray for Pastor Clay and Miss Lauren as they are in Panama. And Pastor Clay is probably preaching just about this time there in that far part of this world. And I pray, God, that you would use your word wherever it is being preached. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Over the last few weeks, actually maybe months, I've been sharing with you about our Christian liberties or our freedom in Christ. And as I begin to read and study for this week's message, it seems that that subject keeps running together for me. As a matter of fact, the text that I just read basically says to us in print, what I've been preaching to you for the last few weeks is telling us how we are to deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is telling us, as a matter of fact, it goes ahead and is very, very specific about the fact that whatever we do, we should do it in hopes of edifying one another, lifting up one another, not ever tearing one another down. And so as we preach this morning, although I told you that series was over with, there will be some likenesses as we go through this morning's message. You see, the key to our Christian walk is very simply laid out in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 4, 5 right in there, I believe, maybe... Uh, and it said, actually, verse number 40, uh, he says, If someone compels you to go a mile, that we should go with them twain or two miles. If someone asks for your coat, give them your cloak also. And the very point being made is that we would be willing to go further than that which is required so that we might be edifying not only to ourselves, but to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, with that said, I want to take you to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we'll be there for a bit. So go with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And I want to give you a couple of, actually, three words that I hope will 
will just stick in your mind uh, the title, Be Kind. That's relatively simple for us. But I want you to think about um, the term, a covenant with kindness. Now, I want you to think about that, covenant with kindness, because that's what we're going to see unfolding in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, I'll give you just a little background. However, the background is pretty much explained in the text or in chapter 9. But just a bit of background, if you will. We all know primarily the story of David and Saul and how that, that David was on the run uh, for, for a number of years from King Saul because King, King Saul wanted to kill David. But David had a close relationship with the son of King Saul, Jonathan. And the Bible says literally that they made a covenant of kindness. Now, that, those particular words are actually used in some of the scripture that I'll give you this morning. But the point being, in a very simple term, Jonathan and David had a covenant of kindness one with the other. As a matter of fact, again, it's well stated that way. So let me take you now to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Saul and Jonathan are dead, and David is reigning, if you will, over Israel. And the Bible says this in verse number 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, as I read these 13 verses, I want you to pay attention to the number of times that the word kindness is used because that is the theme of this chapter and literally of this message. Is there someone, I'm paraphrasing, that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. That will also become important as we go through the message. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto him, unto the king, um, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, I want you all to practice with me. We're going to learn to say that name. How many of y'all remember when they actually did phonics in school? Can you imagine trying to teach a first grader Mephibosheth any other way than phonics? So Mephibosheth, you got, you got it already. Let's do it together. Mephibosheth. Y'all are better than first graders. Not much, but a little. So we have Mephibosheth. And if I mispronounce it as I go through the message, I'm not going to correct myself every time. If it sounds like that, you know who I'm talking about. Mephibosheth. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee, there's that word, kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. Now, the phrase, for somebody else's sake, becomes very important as we go through the message. For Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now, this is a long reading, but pay attention to the number of times there is a reference to Mephibosheth eating at, Saul, at David's table. Okay, we've just had it one time. 
And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son, talking about Mephibosheth, all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, for Mephibosheth. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. And there it is again. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of, my, one of the king's sons the third time. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So there are four times that it is mentioned that he had the opportunity, the blessing to eat at the king's table. And there are times that the kindness of David toward Mephibosheth is mentioned. Now, with that said, let me give you something just of a brief explanation of this passage. We know that David and Saul had a covenant of kindness. Now, I'll give you the places in Scripture where those things are listed uh, just a bit later. But... Jonathan was dead, okay? Now, I want you to keep this in mind. The covenant of kindness was between David and Jonathan, but Jonathan was dead. Now, even in our culture today, a contract or a covenant, now, I don't know if we've got any lawyers in the house this morning, but I think you would agree, a contract or a covenant can be broken by the death of one of the parties, depending on how the contract is written. In other words, all contracts are not encumbrant on somebody else, some heir. They're not always incumbent upon that person. And so, in legal terms, the covenant of kindness that David had with Jonathan could very well have ended at Jonathan's death. But David went the extra mile. Now, this is very, very important. It's one of the most interesting passages that I see in the Old Testament. So one may ask, so why would David have even felt the need to go the extra mile when the covenant with Jonathan could have ended at Jonathan's death, but yet David felt the need to show kindness to someone of Saul's descendants for Jonathan's sake. Okay, now that's going to be important as we go through the message. It wasn't for Mephibosheth, it was for Jonathan's sake. Are y'all following me? Say amen. It was because he had made a covenant of kindness with Jonathan, and even though Jonathan was dead, David felt the need to go the extra mile and offer to extend that covenant of kindness to some of the offspring, if you will, of Saul for David's sake. David did not know that it was going to be a son of Jonathan. It could have been another heir or another descendant of Saul because the Bible says that Saul had so many descendants that it could literally have populated a country. So David knew that it could have been one of many of the descendants of Saul. But in this case, in the sovereignty of God, it was Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. Okay, now this is important, so y'all stay with me. So David said... Uh, is, there, is there someone that I can show the kindness of God to? And Mephibosheth was the person. 
Now, do you think it rather odd that the Bible says that Mephibosheth was lame on his feet? Now, you might say, you know, sometimes God gives detail and you just wonder, why did God put that in there? That he was lame on his feet. There are various reasons. Did you know that David to Jonathan, they both died, but that Mephibosheth could have been heir to the throne? But because he was lame on his feet in that day, it was part of tradition or even maybe the law. I would have to check that out. I don't want to be specific on that. That a person who, was, um, who had a handicap, a person who was lame, if you will, could not ascend to the throne. Okay, that was something that was literally written in the law. And so Mephibosheth could not be that heir. He could not take care of himself, and so there was this guy named Machar, or M-A-C-H-A-R, that had taken Mephibosheth in and had cared for him, okay? Now, you might say, boy, this is a long story. Preacher, where are you going with this? Stay with me. You see, David sought out someone to show kindness to. It turned out to be Mephibosheth. He was helpless. He was broken. His condition was irreparable, if you will, and yet David sought him out, brought him in, put him in his house, fed him at his table, even in his state of brokenness and helplessness and in his sight, worthlessness. Did you know that Mephibosheth in his own sight was rather worthless? He said, why would you show kindness to such a dead dog as I am? He saw himself as being worthless, if you will. But David saw him as an individual to which he could show kindness, undeserving of it, but kindness. And what you see unfolding is a beautiful picture of God and his relation with you and I. We are lame, we are helpless, we are hopeless, and yet God, for Christ's sake, not for you, not for me, but for Christ's sake, God reaches out and, listen, and offers us a covenant of kindness. He brings us in and cares for us like David cared for Mephibosheth. Now, Again, this will unfold. And so we see how, what a wonderful picture this is of God's relationship with you and I. David not only sent for Mephibosheth and brought him in, he did something else. He said, Mephibosheth, I'm going to restore to you, which meant to you and your descendants, all of the property, all of the land that your Grandfather Saul once owned. In other words, I believe Saul was a wealthy man. He was the, he was the king. And, but at his death, all those things were lost to David. And David said, because I ha that, that's mine now, I'm going to restore all the stuff, land that belonged to Saul. I'm going to restore that to you, Mephibosheth. Do you see in that a picture of redemption? Do you know if you don't pay your taxes, you lose your land? But there's a time that you can redeem it. Are y'all following me? Redemption in Scripture and our ability to redeem in our culture is very much the same. Once you don't meet your obligation, pay your taxes, your land is sold. But in the meantime, you have a right of redemption. You go in and you pay what you owe and you, your land is redeemed. Saul had lost all of his land. There was nothing to pass on to Mephibosheth. But there is somewhat a picture of redemption when, when David said, listen, I'm not only going to bring you in and take care of you, I'm going to give you back what you have lost. How many of you all know that when God created Adam in the garden, he, it was a perfect place and a perfect deal? Amen? But we lost that. Adam lost that for us. But guess what? When God, for Christ's sake, 
reaches out to us like David did to Mephibosheth. And he brings us in to his house. He brings us in to his kingdom, into his body. He restores what we lost in the garden. Through forgiveness, God cleanses us. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of what? All unrighteousness. And there's a beautiful picture of the redemption that we have in Christ in David's, uh, David's, uh, uh, what David did with Mephibosheth. Now, let me, let me go on just a little bit further. This is, this is a powerful story. I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about being kind, okay? Just bear with me. And so, the Bible says that they were, that was all restored to him. But, but keep this in mind. But Mephibosheth couldn't work the land. So he, how many of y'all have ever been given a gift that turned out to be a job? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, how many of y'all have ever had the blessing of somebody giving one of your children a puppy? Isn't it wonderful for the first 30 minutes? And then the cleanup begins. And it all starts with peas. There's some words, I, 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 but I want to take them to liberty. Pee, puke, and poop. What a gift. Amen? I mean, what a gift. But did you know that David restored to Mephibosheth land that he couldn't work? He couldn't do anything with it. So he said, I'm going to restore the land. And then he told Ziba, now you and your servants are going to work the land for Mephibosheth. And you're going to feed his family. And it's, it's, it's a perpetual decree. So Mephibosheth is the recipient of that which had been lost. But he couldn't maintain it. He could. How many of y'all think you can maintain your salvation? Not a chance. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, does that. And so he tells Ziba, Ziba, your 15 sons and your servants are going to maintain the land for Mephibosheth. Now you talk about an act of kindness. He, you're going to maintain his land. You're going to harvest the crops. You're going to bring in the grain and the fruit and make sure that Mephibosheth's family is taken care of. But Mephibosheth is going to eat at my table. That, it, Mephibosheth wasn't going to eat. With the rest of the family, he says, he's going to eat at my table. Okay? Now, some of y'all are going, okay, all right, where are we going here? There was a covenant of kindness that David had made with Jonathan. And although he could have taken the road that said, my obligation is done when Jonathan died, the Bible says that David sought for someone in Saul's house that he could be kind to for Jonathan's sake. Now, we often talk about eternal security. And though I'm not going to preach that aspect of this this morning, but there's also a beautiful picture here of eternal security. How many of you understand? How many of you are saved? Say amen this morning. Did you know that if you're saved, if you've been born again, if you've been covered by the blood of Jesus, you are eternally secure in the arms of God. All God's people ought to rejoice and say amen. amen. We are eternally secure in the arms of God. Now, the Bible says that several times here that Jonathan, uh, that uh, Mephibosheth will eat at my table. You see, David for Jonathan's sake, reached out to a helpless, hopeless, and by his own words, a dead dog, and brought him in to a place of safety, and even a place of prominence, a place of protection. And God, for Christ's sake, hath reached out to you and I, and he has brought us, even though we were lame 
not necessarily just in our feet, but we were lame and helpless and hopeless. And he has brought us into his house. I say it again. And he sets us at his table. And he provides for us. There's something very interesting about this picture. And I'd like for you to let me just maybe paint a little mind picture for you this morning. And so it's meal time. And David, David's family... We don't know who all David may have invited from meal to meal to sit at the table. But we do know that Mephibosheth continually, the Bible says he continually ate at the king's table. And so we don't know who all was there, but we know that there was obviously David and Mephibosheth and some of David's family and maybe some of David's um, uh, servants. We don't know. But there's the absence of something here that really caught my mind. Did you know that once Mephibosheth was brought into David's house and set at David's table, did you know that we never again hear anything about his lame feet? It's, it's, ne it's never spoken of again. You might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Have you ever noticed this when you sit at someone's table that your feet are covered? Your feet are covered. I mean, I guess you can make an exception if somebody had a glass table. But I mean, practically speaking, when you're sitting at someone's table, even if there was a glass table, I'm sure there would be a table cloth or a table covering. Your feet are covered. How many of you realize that when God reaches out and brings us into his house, that our lameness, our brokenness, our sinfulness is covered? And according to Psalms 103, as far as the east is from the west, never to be mentioned again. There's never another mention of Mephibosheth's lame feet. You know why? Because it was covered at the table of the Lord Jesus. It was covered at David's table, at the table of the Savior, if you will. I just see a beautiful picture there. Did you know that David never said anything else about his lame feet? David, I would say, in that, in that particular representing God. Did you know that none of the other guests around the table, according to the Word of God, none of them, according to what's recorded, none of them ever said... Uh, Hey, Mephibosheth, um, how's your old lame feet doing? No. Did you know that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought not to bring it up. We should not bring up against a brother and sister in Christ what God has covered at his table. Amen. We should never bring up someone else's lameness, brokenness, sinfulness. If it's been covered by the blood and we are set at the Lord's table, we should never again bring those things up. God says, I won't. I'll put it as far as the east is from the west. The guests shouldn't. You and I shouldn't. And I believe it's significant here that Mephibosheth didn't continue to whine about, cry about, or bring up the fact that he had lame feet. You might say, well, now... Did God heal his lame feet? There's no indication of that. The point being made here, his lame feet is like the sin and the brokenness that we have in our lives. And it was never brought up again once David, the Savior, if you will, brought him into his care. Okay? Are y'all following me? Say amen. amen. Guys, this is powerful. I, I love this. I just love this passage. Because I see me. And Brother Wade, I see you. And Brother Blaine, I see you. Brother Mike, I see you. I see us lame, broken, helpless. The Bible says poor, miserable, wretched, naked, and blind. But I see God offering us a covenant of kindness. And involved in that kindness is forgiveness. What did Ephesians say? Be kind, tender-hearted. 
loving each other, forgiving each other, even as God for Christ's sake has... Did y'all get that? Even as God for, for Christ's sake. Listen, if God would have saved me based on what he saw in me, I would never be saved. Brother DJ, if, if, if your being saved was based on what God could see in you, you'd never be saved. But when God looks at us and he looks at us and he sees us in our lameness, he sees us in our fallen state, he sees us in our sinfulness and our brokenness and our hopelessness. And when he looks at us, I believe he sees the Lord Jesus Christ, his son on the cross. And for his sake, he brings us in and he offers us salvation and redemption and love. And all of those things, that package that comes with salvation Listen, not for my sake, but for his son's sake who died so that those things may be forgiven and taken away so that his son's death might not be in vain as far as you are concerned. He saved me for Christ's sake. Brother, he saved you for Christ's sake. Ma'am, he saved you for Christ's sake. We're the beneficiaries of that covenant of kindness. Now, I've got... A little bit of message left, and we'll just make the time fit the message. So y'all follow me here. What a powerful, powerful passage. Because the Bible says that Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. He continually feasted at the king's table. Can I tell you, if you're a child of God this morning, if you're a child of God, you are continually feasting at the king's table. We've got to get this part if we don't get anything else. If you are a child of God today, you are continually feasting at the king's table, at God's table. Listen, you know what that means? That means... We, I don't know if we've got any real active farmers in our church. We've got a bunch of ranchers. But what that means is that crop of wheat that you grew, that's from the king's table. He just used you. He just used you to bring it in. After I finish preaching today, most of us will go sit down to a real hearty meal. Do you know why we're encouraged to thank God for what we eat? Because that's the king's table. That's the king's provision. You might say, no, no, I, I worked hard and made the money that I'm going to spend. No, listen. It's God that gives the ability to have wealth. Mephibosheth enjoyed the blessing of sitting at the king's table continually. Now, one may ask, well, after he ate his meal, do you think he just sat there until the next meal? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I do know this, that when it was time to eat, he was there. But I do believe that there's another real simple truth here, that whether Mephibosheth sat literally at the king's table, that as a child of God, God's forgiveness goes with us. It goes with us. In other words, it's like our salvation. It goes, it goes with us. Now, the Lord will bring that point to fruition for you a little bit later. But whether he sat at the king's table literally hour after hour, I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe he was there during the meals. But the fact of the matter is that God's forgiveness for our sin, our brokenness, our lameness... And God's covenant of kindness is not restricted to a particular location. It goes with us. We are heirs of that blessing. And I believe that Mephibosheth, according to the Bible, for the rest of his life, he enjoyed the benefits of sitting at the king's table, being covered by forgiveness. 
And so one may ask, preacher, what is the application of that story for us today? I don't like for people to, um, I don't like to preach a message and give you a whole lot of, this is, I mean, just like I've preached this morning and then just say, well, what a powerful story and it is powerful and it's already spoken to my heart and I believe it's already spoken to yours. But what's the practical application for you and I today concerning this covenant of kindness? David did not sit and wait for an opportunity to show kindness to come to him. Okay, I want to do this one more time. How many of y'all are saved? Say amen. amen. We must not have an attitude of God, you've, you've shown kindness to me for Christ's sake. And you've said to me in Ephesians 4.32 that I'm to show kindness to others and forgiveness for, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven for Christ's sake. So God, I'm ready to do that. Now I think all of us would agree. We, we're ready to do that. So God, um, when that opportunity comes along, I will exercise that covenant of kindness. I'll be kind. When that opportunity comes along. Can I tell you, that sounds really good. But I think that's like going the required mile. Can we go the extra mile and do what David did? You know what David did? David sought for an opportunity to show kindness. The kindness of God. Did you get that? It's in, read that. David sought for someone to show the kindness of God to for Jonathan's sake. He didn't just wait. Listen, he was the king. He could have waited. His heart could have been right. God, I will show kindness when the opportunity comes my way. But within the boundaries of the word of God, David said no. David said, I'm going to go looking for an opportunity to show the kindness of God to somebody. How many of y'all are willing to go hunting this week? You might say, what do you mean? I'm not a hunter. Well, the Bible, I believe, in principle, teaches us that we need to go the extra mile and look for the opportunity to show the kindness of God to somebody in our lives. Can I get an amen out of that? Amen. Look for somebody to be kind to. You might say, preacher, how does that play out on the ground? Well, I, I can give you some examples. When you, when you go to the post office or go to the store or go wherever you go, instead of being so self-centered and can't wait to get where you're going because you're so much important than everybody else, why don't you slow down at the door and wait for the next person to come along and show them kindness by opening the door for them and letting them go in before you? Now, I know some of you are going, Preacher, that is so simple. Whoever does that now? Very few people. You know why? Because we just sit and wait for some opportunity to come to us. We don't go looking for one. Do you know the other day, just, just, a simple, just a very simple illustration. Brother Dennis and I pulled up to the store the other day to get fuel, and there was a lady pulled in uh, to get fuel, and I know the lady, and she has, uh, she has some physical issues. She was getting ready to get out of her vehicle. And so, and listen, I, I'm, I'm not saying you pattern anything after me. I'm just saying I've been studying this, so I've been reminded. How many of you know that when you're really studying something and the Lord says, okay, do it. <laughs> you're studying it, and you're going to get up behind the pulpit and preach it, so you better do it. And so I simply walked over, and I said, ma'am, if you'd like to stay in your vehicle, you can, and I'll pump your gas for you. And I did that. I mean, guys, come on, guys. You don't have to go to college to learn to pump gas. You just got to have a vehicle and rather drive than walk. And so I just simply pumped the lady's gas for her. And can I tell you that through the years, and, and she may be listening this morning, through the years, we've not had the perfect relationship. Did y'all know that everybody is not fully in love with me? 
I mean, have y'all fear? I mean, I can't figure it out. I'm so sweet. <laughs> but did you know that her reaction to that simple act of kindness meant something to her? She didn't say anything to me. But the next day when I stopped by the store, the fellow there said, that really meant something to her. She said it to him. Now, I'm just saying we can sit in our self-righteousness and say, God, my heart is that I want, to, I want to enter into a covenant of kindness with anybody who can. God, I want to show kindness to somebody for Christ's sake. So if you'll have them step up on my porch, knock on my door, I'll be kind to them. Why don't we go the extra mile like David did? And why don't we say, God, I'm willing to go hunting. I'm willing to take the word of the God, which is the sword of the spirit that indwells me, and I'm going to go hunting. I'm going to find somebody to be kind to. I'm going to open the door for somebody. I'm going to carry a bag of groceries for somebody. I'm going to go out of my way and tell somebody about Jesus. I want to practice a covenant of kindness. There's not a person in this sanctuary this morning, if you're a child of God, there's not one here that cannot practice being kind to somebody else. Kindness manifests itself in many ways. Kindness manifests itself in forgiveness. Kindness manifests itself in benevolence, helping someone like David did to Mephibosheth. Kindness manifests itself in many ways. But in the actual text of Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, I believe the greatest way that kindness manifests itself is through a lack of bitterness, a lack of unforgiveness, a lack of evil speaking one of another. It kind of gets close to home when you really get to looking at the Scripture, doesn't it? David sought for an opportunity to practice a covenant of kindness. Could I encourage all of y'all to do that this week? I don't believe that we can even imagine in our finite minds. I, I don't know that we, can, that we can really imagine what God may do in our own personal lives or in the life of our church. If we would all commit, not to the preacher, not to your Bible teacher, but as a child of God, if you would commit to God this morning, God, I, I am going to seek an opportunity to be kind to somebody. That may mean that you may have to reach in your pocket and take out a few dollars and hand to somebody in a spirit of kindness. It, it may mean that you may need to turn around from wherever you are going in such a hurry it may mean that you might need to turn around and go back and offer to help that person that's broke down on the side of the road. It, it may mean a lot of things. But I know this. I know that David, the king, the king, I, you got to picture it. David, the king, said, I'm going to look for an opportunity to show the kindness of God to somebody for somebody else's sake. And the Bible says, Be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, love one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So I want to challenge you this morning. I'm actually going to ask you to do this. Before you leave today, would you, make a, would you just make a commitment to the Lord that you're going to go the extra mile to be kind to somebody this week? Could I get a head nod and amen? Yeah. Some of you are going, boy, that's going to be tough. Matter of fact, some of you are probably saying, 
Boy, I'm glad preacher's preaching that because I want somebody to be kind to me. If that's your attitude, you missed it all. But I will tell you this. People have a tendency to be kind to people that they see being kind to people. Okay? I can't believe I got all that out in one sentence. <laughs> people have a tendency to be kind to people they see being kind to people. So if you want somebody to be kind to you, be kind to somebody. And I promise it will return. My prayer is that you love Jesus more than you love yourself. And that you'll look for somebody to be kind to. Okay? Be kind. Stick together. We learned that in kindergarten, didn't we? Well, I didn't. I didn't go to kindergarten. I skipped school the day they had kindergarten. <laughs> I hope you love Jesus more than you love yourself. And your purpose to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving. If you have an issue with that, you need to get that right with God. There will never be a better time than today. Let's all stand together. Miss Kristen's going to make her way to the piano.